Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, uh, it's been several years since uh, I said anything um, in a presentation about Brexit because um, it uh, it consumed a lot of our attention uh, way back in 2016 when it became uh, the law of the land in the UK. Um, today uh, in Britain, um, there's very little discussion about Brexit. However, it is um, still enormously um, active in people's minds because um, things uh, have not been going well economically um, uh, in Britain. So uh, what I'd like to do is to um, survey uh, uh, a, a little bit the long history uh, of relations between um, uh, between uh, England and um, the European countries, because there has been a sense of um, doubt uh, about the nature of the relationship for a very, very long time. Now, uh, the history of England and um, Julius Caesar, he actually named the country Britain uh, when he came in 55 BC. And um, let me go to the next slide. Um, okay. Um, across uh, one place that uh, Julius Caesar never actually visited, which would mean invaded, uh, is the country of Ireland. Um, as you can see from this um, uh, photograph taken from the atmosphere, it's a very wet place. And um, I think uh, Julius Caesar didn't feel there was anything worth going after. Uh, however, the relationship between uh, the UK and Ireland uh, has been a long and very troubled one. And uh, what is particularly interesting is the last hundred years during which um, Ireland managed to separate itself from the UK and uh, it um, then uh, uh, struck out as an independent country, but it's only in the last 20 or 30 years that the country has reached the level of self-confidence that you'd expect with a truly independent country and one that's uh, having uh, quite a significant impact, uh, particularly because one area that Ireland seems to do very well at is diplomacy. And um, Mary, could, uh, uh, oh, can I go to the next? Um, I'm, I'm hitting the button. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm looking for the right button here for the, uh, oh, oh, there, yes. Um, so uh, one of the hot and difficult uh, topics today is the whole question of Northern Ireland and the border between the South and North. And so what I'd like to do is to um, show you this image, first of all, which you can see, this is a border. Uh, you notice that uh, cars are driving on the left side of the road. Uh, Ireland, Ireland uh, maintains that uh, legislation um, that uh, we that people there uh, ride on the left, uh, drive their cars on the left side of the road, um, and it and it um, that hasn't changed. It's not going to change. But one of the things you notice uh, in this picture is everything looks very, very peaceful. Now that is of huge importance, um, both to um, Britain and to Ireland. Uh, Britain is in an awkward situation because it's made commitments to uh, the Protestant minority of the population in Northern Ireland. And um, at the same time, the Republic of Ireland uh, does not want to have an armed military style border between the two parts of the same country. Um, 
uh, the Republic of Ireland in the south and west, and the um, Protestant minority uh, in the uh, north and east. So let me go to the next slide, if we can. Thank you very much. Now we're looking at Europe. We're looking at a building that uh, was built and is being preserved. It was built during uh, the time of Roman Britain. And um, it's uh, interesting to see how persistent the idea of Europe is um, as something that traces its organizations first to the Roman Empire, then uh, when that empire um, seemed to fade away, um, then there was a revival of the idea of one large super state. And that of course was the, um, uh, the state ruled over by Charlemagne, uh, which came into power with his coronation in 800 uh, AD. Uh, next slide, if I may. Okay. And so if you look at the size of that, um, uh, on, on the map, you can see that this was a huge slice of Europe. And one of the aims of the uh, empire, the Holy Roman Empire, it was called, one of the aims of that empire was to keep the peace, uh, to keep the peace between all these European countries. And one of the rationales for keeping the peace is that you might start out on a trip from London, probably by on foot, and you could go the whole way down to um, Jerusalem. Uh, and in the days of the Roman Empire, the Caesar's Roman Empire, they enforced the peace. And that actually meant in the early days of Christianity, people who wanted to make pilgrimages were able to go safely uh, from um, the uh, Anglo-Saxon England and the uh, North uh, in, in, on the left in this picture, all the way down to Jerusalem and other holy places that people travel to. Next picture. Yeah. Um, since the time of um, Charlemagne, the, the next biggest uh, empire in Europe was the Austrian, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which uh, was one of the most successful of all empires. And uh, indeed, in the period leading up to the 1914 war, uh, their very old um, but skillful uh, emperor, uh, Kaiser, um, he kept the peace. And uh, however, uh, the explosion of World War I uh, with the assassination of his son, uh, that explosion resulted in um, uh, a, a whole reformation of the, um, the new uh, empire. So um, that, that is a, a very... So now um, in the period right after World War II, the question arose, um, why not increase um, the solidarity and the strength of um, uh, Europe by having um, a country uh, that essentially invited all the members of the old Europe to become one entity in which each would give up a little bit of sovereignty and uh, sovereignty was not um, um, something that they felt was threatened. Um, the idea of having a united Europe actually uh, originally uh, was Winston Churchill's idea and he was thinking about it in um, 1941, during a time when uh, they were really, really struggling uh, with two big wars going on um, in which Britain and the US were involved, uh, the, um, the European war and um, the war um, in, in the uh, Middle East and the Far East. Um, so um, after, um, Churchill's um, time in office, um, the idea of uh, having a European um, uh, relationship was getting more um, uh, persuasive. And so um, the idea was reinforced um, by uh, founding a European 
um, uh, a, 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 a European conglomerate of countries. And uh, that, um, that idea came into, um, in, in the 1950s, and then was secured by a treaty, the Treaty of Rome. Can I go to the next slide? Um, I'll go to the next slide if we, okay. Yeah, that was Churchill in his prime. And uh, here on the next slide, we quote uh, Winston Churchill. Can I go to the next slide? Okay. And he says um, uh, in 1942, Hard as it is to say now, I trust that the European family may act unitedly as one under a Council of Europe. And I look forward to United States of Europe. Um, and that was something that he was thinking of in 1942. He was thinking of how the world could be reorganized, how Europe could be reorganized to avoid more wars. Next picture. Uh, and um, he found uh, European leaders such as uh, Conrad Adenauer, the German chancellor, uh, who were ready to work with him. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, uh, they were ready to work with uh, Churchill and with his successors. And can we go to the next slide? Um, sorry. Oh, oh, no, go back one. Go back one. Um, OK. Uh, the people who um, were most persuasive uh, inside Europe on this whole issue were um, a Robert Schumann, a former French prime minister, and um, Jean Monnet, who was a French diplomat who was enormously important during the successful final years of World War II. And these guys uh, had seen three terrible wars, 1817, 1914, and now the war that was just concluded, and they didn't want any more uh, wars. And so they said, let's um, get France and Germany uh, linked through a treaty that uh, recognized that they should unite in the area of coal and steel uh, production, and they should create an economic unit that would make war impossible. That was the dream. When we talk about Britain's relationship, um, it's not so often conceded that this is the big organizing idea behind uh, the European Union. Okay, next picture. Yeah, go, go next. Go next. Okay, so um, when we talk about Brexit, we're talking about something that is catastrophic, um, but one of the reasons that um, is that when the first entrance into Europe, which happened in the early 1970s, when Britain came into Europe, at that time, um, the, uh, the, the worries that many members of the electorate had were um, what, uh, what kind of impact will joining the European Union have on our sovereignty. And so um, uh, one of the top legal advisor to Prime Minister Harold Macmillan said um, there, he said to Macmillan, there are three issues concerning sovereignty. First of all, Parliament would have to accept rulings by the European Union Council of Ministers. Number two, Britain would have to abide by European Union treaties. And number three, um, the European Court of Justice would be the final arbiter in judicial matters. Now, for some English people, that was very, very hard to swallow. And in fact, one of the reasons they've had such a catastrophe with Brexit is that the politicians in power at the time uh, didn't really uh, take this message that Lord Kilmure, the top uh, legal mind in Macmillan's administration, they uh, weren't, uh, they, they, they just weren't, um, uh, they, they felt that uh, these issues were not given the attention that they require. And so, um, in fact, 
the way the European Union has worked out for the various other countries, um, and in particular, uh, Ireland, um, is that you gave up a little bit of sovereignty, but uh, you had a full voice in um, the Council of Ministers and the head of each government uh, would go into the meetings of the Council of Ministers with all the authority uh, of a single vote that they had. And um, they tended to not take decisions without first having a lot of time, a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. And they built up personal relationships that were very strong. So that in actual fact, these issues that uh, troubled Britain um, were much less disturbing to the other members uh, of, and as a, as a matter of fact, the dynamic of having the most powerful member of each government uh, uh, have the um, say of that government in uh, the council meetings that left them with a lot of power, but also with the need to spend a lot of time uh, talking to each other. Uh, luckily for Ireland, um, their leader uh, had spent a lot of time sitting next to Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, during these uh, meetings of the European Council. And um, not only was she the smartest person on the council, but also she listened very patiently and was very, very supportive um, uh, of the Irish when uh, they were in the very uh, frightening position of just having uh, become very happy in the European Union. Now with Brexit, once that um, vote was taken and once the, um, the government of um, David Cameron was thrown out of office, uh, once that was taken, uh, it was a time of great worry and great anxiety. Uh, uh, the Irish were receiving pressure from England uh, to join with them. And they said, no, we, we don't really want to do that. Uh, we're happy in the European Union. So why would one country be so much happier than the other? Well, partly because um, the uh, Irish were never threatened by the idea of the European Union. Uh, they were never threatened simply because um, uh, they were um, uh, able to um, participate in the governance. Uh, they were able to participate uh, in a very enthusiastic uh, relationship between the Council of Europe and uh, Ireland. And the other thing is that um, uh, Ireland, of course, as a country that was divided, and that division was done by Britain in 1922, um, and it uh, led to very bitter feelings uh, as a Northern Irish state was carved out of the island of Ireland. And then that uh, state um, became um, uh, dependent on uh, Britain for three to five billion dollars of support every year. And uh, also uh, it had a long tradition of saying no to almost any proposal that um, was put before it. And so uh, things now have changed very, very radically. Um, but uh, let me go to the next, let's go to the next slide. I think the mistake that lay behind um, uh, the, the uh, uh, Brexit thing was that back in the um, 60s and 70s, an insufficient amount of time had been spent preparing the British for a very modest reduction in their sovereignty. Uh, but then uh, you got a lot of protections, um, particularly as um, the European Union encapsulated the famous four freedoms, which included uh, freedom of movement, uh, freedom of trade, um, freedom um, of, of uh, property, uh, very significant liberties that all of the citizens of Europe have, Britain doesn't. Next slide. And uh, I, the, there was a second referendum taken in 1975, and it was taken by um, Harold Wilson. And that referendum, uh, at that time, the British were pretty happy with their situation. And uh, 
they uh, voted two to one um, uh, to remain in the European Union. However, uh, in the time between that and Brexit, uh, media underwent an enormous amount of change and media became aggressive, nasty, and uh, in many instances, downright mendacious. And that was the case uh, with anything written uh, or said about the European Union. Um, next picture. One of the most effective uh, British diplomats, however, when um, the uh, European Union came into being was Margaret Thatcher. And although she didn't like the idea of the European Union, she accepted it as a fact. And uh, she was able to persuade uh, the Europeans to um, spend a lot of money on uh, the UK, but also she was able to introduce her neoliberal ideas into the European Union, in particular uh, ideas uh, about the single market. And she saw the European Union mainly as uh, a trading uh, uh, relationship because, of course, you had no tax, you had no um, uh, import duties or uh, others. There were no restrictions on trade. Goods could move freely. Uh, she liked that. Um, uh, but the um, uh, the the uh, European Union um, uh, also uh, involved um, laws that many of the laws had been uh, drawn up before uh, the um, um, before Britain entered uh, the European Union, which meant those laws couldn't be changed by Britain, it, or nor would Britain have had any input into those laws. So that did start things off on an unequal footing. Go to the next picture. Good. Uh, yeah, and let's go to the next one. Yeah, um, and actually at this point, I'm going to turn off the pictures and I'm just going to talk about some of the things that are going on in Britain today. Um, and so um, I hadn't realized um, how um, troubled things are in Britain right now. Uh, there are uh, a lot of strikes uh, happening. Uh, the uh, railway system has deteriorated terribly. It was privatized um, and the companies that got control um, uh, sucked a lot of the money out of it. And so it's in a, their famous railway. They had the first railway system in the world and um, they uh, contributed enormously uh, to rail transport and all the social impact it has. Anyway, they lost that. Um, uh, also, um, uh, the uh, issues such as electricity, um, uh, for which um, people uh, obviously have to pay, but they feel they're paying way, way too much. And so uh, right now, uh, Britain, uh, according to uh, a survey on British social attitudes, um, they're ready for a change to a more left-wing type of government, um, uh, m considerably more to the left than Tony Blair, who's shown in this picture here. And um, uh, so um, another thing that is a very startling thing to learn is that the United Nations has been monitoring Britain uh, because of the um, uh, immiseration of uh, people uh, very much uh, due to government policy. Um, the uh, Conservative Party that has ruled now since 2010, uh, they have been um, uh, uh, they have been um, uh, enacting policies of uh, austerity. And so uh, as much as Brexit has contributed to their uh, problems right now, and of course, if you if you cut yourself off economically, from the biggest market in the world, the European uh, market of 27 nations, that is the largest economic unit in the world. If you cut yourself off from that, 
and have a lot of tariffs and barriers and so forth, uh, you're you're going to have a very very um, uh, you're you're going to lose a lot of customers and you're going to lose a lot of business, and so a lot of this has been happening. But even more severe than this uh, Brexit issue has been uh, the austerity policies which were introduced by the Conservative Party in um, 2010, and so uh, these things have gotten so badly that the United Nations, which which routinely uh, visits and analyzes the situation in countries that have severe poverty. And right now in Britain, um, about five years ago, uh, Britain had, um, uh, it, it, they had 35 food banks. Now they have um, several thousand uh, food banks um, because there are such problems with um, hunger and, and, and so forth. So there's an organization called the Trussell Trust, uh, which um, looked at 35 um, uh, banks, uh, food banks way back in, uh, in, 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 in uh, 10 years ago. And now it, the situation is, is, is altogether more uh, serious. So it's an austerity agenda which has meant that um, uh, taxes are much more regressive. Um, so the taxes that you have, you have local council taxes, which are pretty hard on working class and poorer people. Uh, you have a value added tax, which also hits uh, poorer people. And uh, then uh, the situation with regard to taxation, it's, it's a better situation for people who are well off but definitely not uh, for, for, for people who are, who are poor. So we really have um, a very unhappy situation there. And um, uh, right now, the United Nations um, uh, maintains, according to their special rapporteur who was sent in to investigate, 29% uh, of children in the UK now live in, pauper in, in poverty. That's startling. and. I would never have imagined anything that severe, uh, but this this has this is what is happening. So uh, right now, it's as if the population um, uh, don't any longer um, uh, expect anything good out of Brexit. It, it, it's almost as if Brexit has slipped out of discussion in newspapers and media and so forth. It's just seen as one of those bitter disappointments. And so uh, that tends to be very divisive uh, for British society because you have the people who wanted Brexit and now are bitterly disappointed that it doesn't seem to have delivered on the things that uh, they were hoping for. And on the other hand, um, uh, the people who hated Brexit are very, very unhappy. And that includes people who liked to have easy access to France and Spain. And uh, many people, many English people chose to live in both in either France or Spain. And uh, however, things became much more complicated for them uh, once you um, cut off um, Britain from the European Union. Um, so um, I, uh, I just, um, yeah. Uh, so at present, if, if there was an election uh, and there will have to be an election before 2005, um, so they'll have an election uh, just as we're, we're having an election, but our election in the United States is um, fixed by a historic calendar. And so it'll be in November the 5th. They have the discretion of calling an election whenever the prime minister and um, his cabinet decide that it's going to happen. But you may have noticed that in Britain in the last few years, there have been, I think, nine prime ministers. This is extraordinary because typically that was a very stable position. Uh, but there, uh, after David Cameron lost um, the uh, referendum in 2016, in, in June of 2016, he um, 
then um, he uh, uh, stepped down. Uh, his place was taken by Theresa May. She had a really miserable time uh, and tried her best, was but was ultimately unsuccessful. Um, then we had the chaotic uh, premiership of Boris Johnson. And then more recently, uh, we had for a brief while, uh, Liz, Lynn Truss, uh, whose prime ministership was regarded as a kind of a very dangerous joke. And things got so bad that the Bank of England had to um, give a warning. And so they replaced her uh, with the present prime minister, um, Ricky Srunak, but he's not particularly uh, Srunak, he's not particularly popular. Um, the polls show that Labour is more likely to take over. And they don't exactly have a very strong leadership. And they had a recent disaster with um, a, a man called Corbyn, who, was, who, who never made it as prime minister, but did have one very promising election. Uh, but then the next election, um, he did uh, much more poorly. So they, they have a government in waiting, um, but the job they will have to do will be absolutely huge if they can address any of these problems. Um, it's been asked, could they go back into the uh, European Union? Well, that's not going to happen. Uh, they insulted so many people and the relationships uh, were so disastrous. Uh, the, and the way the negotiation was handled, um, it, it, it actually left very little time. And this is by choice. Uh, the UK um, sought as rapid as possible uh, an exit, uh, but they then negotiated a very harsh uh, Brexit. And now uh, they're living with the consequences of that. So... Um, uh, some some uh, of some very good uh, writing about um, the present situation is in a recent issue of the uh, New York Review of Books, uh, an article by Gary Young, uh, who lives in uh, the UK and the US. He he'll live ten years in one, then ten years in the other, and so he's been looking at um, what what one might call toxic populism, the effects of toxic populism, both in Britain and the United States, and uh, how it can produce a very nasty kind of politics, but not a very happy outcome. So a recent article by him about the situation in the UK was entitled Small Island. And uh, that's another issue that uh, one of the Danish uh, finance ministers uh, made a comment that some countries uh, don't understand uh, that they've actually, they've gone from being a big nation uh, to being a small nation without really fully comprehending uh, how, how things uh, became that way. Um, I'm particularly interested in the situation um, uh, in the Irish Republic because um, that's where I was born and um, in fact, I was born before Ireland was a republic, so that meant I was born a subject of King George VI. Didn't matter to me, but um, it does mean that I have the option of being a UK citizen, uh, as well as being um, the luckiest one, having a US citizenship, and then having an Irish citizenship, which of course has meant uh, being a member of the European Union and enjoying the benefits that go with that. Um, Irish um, people now are, uh, their satisfaction with the um, uh, uh, present status of the, of the country um, is they, they, they accept the European Union with above 90% uh, interest. But what they're unhappy about in, in Ireland at the moment is the deep, problem of shortage of housing. And this actually could have a tremendous impact on the next election um, because um, the uh, housing situation in Ireland is really, really bad. And it's, it's, uh, so it's something that um, has given an opportunity for a very uh, destabilizing political party. They're called Sinn Féin. 
Sinn Féin comes from a Gaelic uh, term me meaning we ourselves. It was used 100 years ago in the fight for independence. It generally, uh, it generally um, means um, a, a very um, a radical type of governance. I would not like to see that happen in Ireland. Um, however, fortunately, um, in recent weeks, uh, Sinn Féin have been falling in the polls. They're not doing so well, and so they may become more like a regular political party. So um, perhaps uh, uh, I could stop at this point, and uh, I'd love to take questions um, on, uh, on either uh, the issues of Ireland um, or England and the European Union. Okay. <laughs>